Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew again. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about how since Mendel's time, we've learned that there are many different variations in inheritance pattern. In other words, exceptions to Mendel's laws. And so this is gonna be pretty rapid fire. I'm gonna hit a lot of concepts in this. And there will be some sample problems that we'll do in class and maybe some for homework as well. So hopefully if you need a little bit of detail on each of these types, we can look at some specific ones in class. So just to quickly review, um, I'll talk about some incomplete dominance. I will talk about the idea of co-dominance. We'll also talk about the concept of multiple alleles. We'll talk about pleiotropy. And we'll also talk about epistasis. We will discuss the concept of polygenic inheritance. We will also look at the role of environment in the production of phenotype. And that will fill in with the concept of sex-linked traits. So a lot to get to in here. Hopefully uh, we can get through these in a reasonable manner. Here we go. All right, so the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is pause and think. And in this pause and think, what I'm going to have you do is I'd like you to predict the genotypes that you would get in the cross between this red flower that is a big R, big R, and the white flower that is little r, little r. So all I want you to do is come up with the genotypes that you would get from this. Pause and think. All right, so hopefully what you came up with is that if I made these crosses, I would end up getting uh, four different plants that would be big R, little r. Um, that's nice there. So that note, I, I, I talked specifically about genotypes here. So well, what if I was talking about phenotypes? Well, if this was a Mendelian inheritance, you would expect to have all of them show the dominant trait red. But as you noted up on the top, what we have here is intermediate inheritance and intermediate inheritance is an incomplete dominance. This is where some red will be shown, but not quite as much as you'd get as if you would have big R, big R. And so in this particular instance, what we see is that these are going to look like they are pink flowers. I think the example I use in your textbook is of the four o'clock uh, flowers or the amaryllis flowers that show this. But this is a case where you should still be able to do the genotypes just as you would have predicted, but the phenotypes are obviously different in this particular case. So this is what we see with intermediate inheritance. We see a blending. And in fact, this is what uh, Charles Darwin would have expected and possibly even what was expected by Mendel when he did his first experiments, but he did not see this blending that occurred. Uh, he was quite fortunate that all of his traits ended up showing Mendelian traits as you know, one might expect. So our next pattern that we're gonna look at is the idea of codominance. And codominance and incomplete dominance are often thought of together because in both cases, what you end up getting is a blending appearance that occurs. So in this particular instance, we have an individual with type O blood, the mother, so that's little i, little i, that's recessive blood, crossed with a father who has type A, B blood. And so in this instance, what you can see is that both the A protein and the B protein are expressed by dad. And so what we see here is that if I cross mom that has type O and or the homozygous recessive form with type AB that's dad, what I end up seeing is half of the offspring will have type A blood and half the offspring will have type B blood. And that's because this father is sometimes passing on a dominant A blood type and sometimes passing on a dominant B type. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to pause and think, and I'm going to set this cross up here. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pause and think, and what would happen if you ended up getting a cross between a mother who was type AB and a father that was type AB? I want you to pause and think, and I'd like you to tell me the genotypes and the phenotypes of the offspring in that cross. Pause and think. All right, so hopefully you set your Punnett square up to look like this, where you'd have the mother on the top, and you'd have a type A here and a type B here, and the father over here on the side, similar model, type A and type B. And what you notice is that one of the four offspring is going to be type A, and they'll be homozygous dominant type A. And one of the offspring would be type B, and they're going to be homozygous uh, type B. And the other two individuals will be type AB. Uh, the individual on the lower left here is going to be type A from mom and type B from dad. And this one in the upper right is going to be uh, type A from dad and type uh, B from mom. But regardless, they're going to be type AB blood. 
right? This is going to be co-dominance because when A and B are both present, they're both expressed, they're both dominant. Expressed when present is our definition for dominance, and we see in this instance, okay? I'm still a blending like uh, we saw in incomplete dominance, but a little different type of blending. All right, blood typing is also excellent to talk about the concept of multiple alleles. And as I showed you here earlier before, we actually don't have just a simple dominant and recessive allele. We don't have just a big I and a little I, but we have a big I with an A, a big I with a B, and a little I. Because there are more than two alleles, we refer to blood typing as having multiple alleles. And so this is another important concept. And this is one of the reasons blood typing is so often used on uh, SAT biology tests and honors biology tests and AP biology tests because it allows you to test multiple different types of inheritance that are exceptions to Mendelian traits. All right, so another interesting thing about the blood typing is uh, the pattern that we see with them, and that is that red blood cells are going to have either a type A protein that sticks out on them, a type B protein that would stick out of them, or a type AB proteins that stick out of them, or no proteins. And so when we talk about blood typing, really that's based off of what are the protein markers that stick out of the surface of the red blood cells, and that's what leads to the different typing. And again, there are multiple alleles, so you can either have an A, a B, or neither A and B, that's the recessive, and so that's the reason that we end up seeing this with blood typing. All right, so let's talk about pleiotropy. So what is pleiotropy? Pleiotropy is the idea of having multiple phenotypes from a given genotype. So the example we often use is the idea of sickle cell anemia and or sickle cell hemoglobin. So in the case of sickle cell hemoglobin, if you have two copies of normal hemoglobin, you have no sickle cell anemia, you just have non-sickle cell anemia or normal red blood cells. If you have one copy of normal, the, the A in this instance, and one sickle cell trait, you have referred to as sickle cell trait, and some of your red blood cells will have a sickle shape to them. If you have two copies of the S allele, you will have sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease. Now, why is this an example of pleiotropy? In addition to the change of your red blood cells, it's been found that individuals with sickle cell trait or sickle cell anemia have a resistance to the parasitic disease malaria. And so this is a second phenotype you get. Not only do you have this change in your red blood cells, but you have this second trait of malarial resistance. So in areas of the world, like equatorial regions where you have high instances of malaria, being heterozygous is a huge advantage. And we see this as a heterozygote advantage associated with sickle cell trait, and we see a higher allele frequency for sickle cell anemia. In areas of the world where malaria is not found, it's not endemic, uh, we don't see any added benefit. And in fact, one in four children of a cross between two individuals who are carriers for sickle cell trait will end up having sickle cell anemia, which is quite a dangerous trait, particularly uh, in the past when there was less medical intervention. So what we see here is this example of crossing two individuals with sickle cell trait. In an area with no malaria, the child that does not have sickle cell anemia has two normal copies of the gene. They're going to have a huge advantage in survivability. Uh, the two children in the middle uh, will have some abnormal red blood cells, and therefore they have a slightly reduced uh, survivability or oxygen carrying capacity. Not dramatically impacted, but uh, there is some variation person to person in that. And then the individual that gets two S alleles is going to have uh, sickle cell disease. In the region where malaria is present, those two children in the middle actually are going to be the most likely to survive and reproduce and pass on their traits. Uh, and so this is what we see in pleiotropy is multiple phenotypes happening as a result of a single genotype. All right, the other word that's up here is the concept of epistasis. Um, and I came across this example when I was uh, looking around. Uh, epistasis is when there is a second gene that is sort of a regulatory gene that can turn on or off 
a particular gene. So we talk about hair color, and hair color is not a simple Mendelian trait, but in this model, let's pretend it is. And so let's say you could have a gene for blonde hair or a gene for red hair. Uh, let's imagine that everybody either had blonde hair or red hair. And so we've got this, this simple gene. Um, but now let's say there's a second uh, gene, and if you have this second gene, you have no hair, you're bald. Um, it really doesn't matter whether you have the blonde genotype or the red genotype, the bald genotype is going to eliminate your hair, and therefore you're not actually going to be able to see the phenotype from that first gene. This is an example of epistasis. We also see this in um, albino uh, mice uh, a lot of times, or in albinos of other forms, that there may be a gene for a pigment um, difference, either a, a red color or a brown color or a dark brown color or a light brown color. But if you happen to have this secondary gene that causes albinism, you don't make the pigment at all, and therefore you would lack the pigment. Um, I liked the baldness example because I think it's a pretty clear example that if you aren't producing the thing that ends up expressing the alleles, you don't have it at all. All right, so polygenic inheritance. Polygenic is exactly what it sounds like. It means many genes. And polygenic inheritance results from a wide uh, range of phenotypes because you have a wide range of genes. In this particular example, um, this is to model the idea of skin color. Skin color is a polygenic trait. Um, and in that polygenic instance, what we would find is there are many different genes. Uh, in this model, it's showing three different genes. Uh, I've seen anything from three to six uh, different genes. It's at least three that are, are really strongly associated with it, but there's probably more genes as well. And so what we can see is that simply comparing a one gene where you would either have dominant or recessive, or even in the case of an incomplete dominance, possibly three different forms, when you go up to having three genes, you can have six different variants. And so as a result of this, you can see that there is now a bell curve of shape where most individuals are going to show the average trait, again, from a cross of two individuals that are heterozygous for all of them. But you have some on one uh, end of the spectrum that are going to be super light and some that are going to be super dark. And so what we see here is that as you add more genes in, you're going to get more variation um, and greater width to your bell curves. Bell curves are going to be super important when we come to uh, evolution, and we're going to look at a lot of polygenic traits and selection within communities of these polygenic traits and within the bell. Um, this is going to be super important when we come back later on to looking at uh, patterns of evolution. All right, so we talked about skin color, but you guys all know this. We just came out of the summer. Skin color is not just controlled by sets of genes. There are environmental factors that will also influence this. So as you can imagine, this individual who had a fairly light pigment did not use sunscreen and spend way too much out the time out in the sun. And therefore, the environment is now producing a phenotype. This is a red skin phenotype. So the reason I have this slide in is to note that Environmental conditions also affect phenotypic expression. And so in most of the instances we've been talking about, we've been just looking at simple, um, you have this gene or that gene or this combination of genes and you get this particular component. But it's important to note that both genes and the environment ultimately shape phenotype. And this poor person who posted their picture up on the internet is going to be our example to remind us of that, that even though there are three or six different genes that could control skin color, there's also an environmental factor that plays a role. All right, so lastly, we're going to talk about the idea of sex-linked patterns of inheritance. And so uh, we'll get into sex chromosomes in a little bit, but um, hopefully you know this, that uh, males have two sex chromosomes, an X and a Y, and females have two X chromosomes. Uh, the X chromosomes that the females have are completely um, independent. They got one X for mom and one X for dad, so they can still have variation between those two X's. Males only get one X chromosome. They got X chromosome from mom, and they get the Y chromosome from dad. And so what ends up happening is that when you have traits that occur on the X chromosome, you get a slightly different pattern than Mendelian inheritance when it looks to passing them on. Now, it's true that women will have the two X chromosomes. They get one from mom and one from dad. And so in women, sex-linked genes tend to look fairly 
normal. They're like any other chromosomes. But in males, males only get the one X chromosome. And remember, dominant alleles are expressed when present, and recessive alleles are expressed when not when there's no dominant present. So what that means is that if I'm a male and I have a Y chromosome that I got from dad, if I get an, a dominant allele from mom, I'm going to show that dominant allele. If I get a recessive allele for mom, I'm going to show that allele because I only have the two. And so what we have here is an instance where uh, mom is heterozygous, but unaffected. We call her a carrier. And dad has the dominant allele, so he just, just has the one allele. When these two go to get crossed, what we find is that one of the sons who gets Y from dad and the X from mom he is going to end up showing this X link trait. And the term affected here has this negative connotation, and this could be very mild. So, for example, red green colorblindness is a classic example of a sex linked trait that occurs in males. And it happens about 10 times more common in the US population that males have red green colorblindness about 10 times more often than females. But it could also be something like hemophilia, which is a much more dangerous disease, um, has much greater impact. In, especially before the advent of medical inter intervention such as factor VIII, it would have been a deadly disease. And again, it was almost unheard of in females. It was very rare because you would have had to have gotten uh, two copies, one from an affected dad and one from a carrier mom, in order to have a daughter with it. So it was almost very rare or almost unheard of to get a hemophiliac female in the past. Now you can actually have um, hemophiliac males surviving to reproduce and possibly um, uh, having children with uh, a carrier um, female. All right. So I know that was a whirlwind. That was a lot of traits. I hope that was helpful and I will talk to all of you soon.